Hey, we'd like to take a minute to thank our sponsor, Isotope, makers of software and plugins for audio repair, mixing, and mastering. We use Isotope products here at the High Gain. It's an important part of how we've been able to bottle pure podcast gold week after week. And guess what? Isotope offers one free month of Music Production Suite Pro, which has all the tools you need to mix, master, and repair audio. Also, you can get 10% off all other software using the promo code FRET10. That's F-R-E-T-1-0. All of this is at isotope.com, I-Z-O-T-O-P-E dot com. Hey, this is Ed Peterson. And this is John Kilticka. And this is the High Gain Podcast. The High Gain Podcast, Ed. Yeah, what do we talk about, John? We talk about guitars, pedals. Uh, yep. Okay. Where are you <laughs> recording from, John? <laughs> I, I am again in the bunker, Ed, but it's very quiet down here. Yeah, why is that? I kicked the cat out. No more cat this week. Yeah, I'm also in my West Seattle basement. Waffle, waffle syrup butter has been barking, so I don't know. We might have some barking interruptions. Nice. He's 14 and kind of blind and kind of deaf, so he just sits around and growls at nothing. You know, I think I can relate to that. (laughs) Yeah. He's an oldie guy. He's got no teeth. Zero. Zero teeths. Zero teeth? Yep. It's sunny out today. Maybe I'll go down to the beach. You survived it last week. I'll remain many feet from people, but you know what I'm saying. I know what you're saying. Maybe we need those big bubbles that you walk in, that Wayne Coyle and the Flaming Lips use. Did you see the concert they did? No. Yeah, they did a concert, and at the start of it, the floor of the auditorium was just full of these deflated balloons, and then people came in, and they shoved them all in those balloons that Wayne goes in, and then the band was actually like, playing guitars, playing drums inside those inflatable balloons. And then the entire crowd was in those balloons. I like that quite a bit. It's pretty good. Yep. And those guys are from... uh, Oklahoma. Yeah. I've got sunshine on a cloudy day When it's cold outside I've got the month of May Yeah, I guess you say What can make me feel this way, my girl Talking about my girl Beverages Beverages, Ed I gotta tell you, John Yeah You have done a bunch of songs, and you, like, play around with how the cover would be. Yeah. That was maybe my favorite. How come? Well, I mean, that song is great, but I feel like you went kind of off cadence of the delivery and... A little more organic? Yeah, yeah. Maybe not totally off melody, but, you know. (laughs) Yeah, I like that you completely disregarded the cadence and the melody and the key of the song. (laughs) Was it pitchy, dog? <laughs> it, was, it was hella pitchy. I, all of that, I actually loved. I, I thought it was great. Thank you. What are you doing? I got one of those little ditto loopers. Isn't that pretty cool? Oh, ditto loopers are awesome. Yeah. Those things are great. Bulletproof. Ed? Yeah. What are you drinking? I have a Celsius sparkling watermelon beverage. What? Yeah, I don't know. Vicky was going up to Bartels to get something. They didn't have any Orca beverages. Oh, man. So I'm down to Celsius sparkling watermelon. No sugar, no preservatives. Is there a slogan? Healthy energy accelerates metabolism, burns body fat. Is that a slogan? I think so. Yeah. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) What about you? I've got some water, as always. I've got some primarily black coffee. Uh Uh-huh. And a little strawberry juice, like a protein smoothie juicy thing. Okay. I have an announcement about foodstuffs. Oh, yeah? 
super fan Kev Boy face. Yeah. He has undertaken the manufacture of bespoke hot sauces. That is very much a thing. And he sent me a bottle of El Enojado, which means the angry one. That's a great name. Chipotle hot sauce. That is a great name. And somehow he figured out how to have the burn there, Mm -hmm. but not too heavy. So you could put it on just about anything. And the bottle he sent us is almost gone. So if that is an indication of quality manufacture in hot sauces, then maybe our viewers want to look up El Enojado on the Instagram. I don't know if I could even do that. E-L. E-L, yes. Space. E-N-O. Uh-huh. J-A-D-O. Enojado. That sounds like a classic Enojado to me. Yeah, a classic Enojado hot sauce. Yeah. I got a guitar here, Ed. Okay. This is a Univox guitar. Univox UC2, to be exact. Hell yeah. Imagine a shape that is offset, yep, like a Mustang, like a Jazz Master Jaguar kind of deal, yep, but more exaggerated. Yeah. It's got two single coils in this case. The UC3 would have had three. It's got a tremolo on it and a pickup selector. The neck is double bound. And the fret markers are on the side of the fretboard. Imagine where the dots usually are. Mm -hmm. Just move them over to the left. And so they're right up against the binding, which is kind of cool. Okay. Strat style headstock that says Univox on it. That's all there is to that, but it is fantastical. Oh my God. It's so cool looking. I don't know if I've ever seen one in the shape this one is in. It could be new. I don't know that I've ever seen this body style before. You know how long they made this thing for? Uh, Four days. Slightly more than four days. One year. Oh, okay. 1965. One and done. So the body's got that weird bevel to it. You know how on a Stratocaster viewers, where your arm rests, it's beveled right there. If you took that bevel and went over to the other side, that's what you would have. Yeah. It's, it's wild. The knobs on it? Yes are something different too, right? They are skirted knobs. Ooh, skirted. Yeah, I think Ed calls them witch hats. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the brim of the witch hat is what I might call a skirt. That part is silver with black numbers. And then on the top of the hat or the skirt, it's silver with the letters V and T for volume and tone. Appropriately vintagey. If you look up witch hat knob, it's totally a thing. I wonder, is there a preferred nomenclature? This is me saying, I don't know, Ed. I don't know. I go to the Fender website. Oh. And I look up 1965 Jazzmaster knobs. Right. And they are pure vintage 1965 Jazzmaster witch hat knobs. Witch hat. All right. How many positions is the pickup selector? Three. Middle is just both? Are they in phase or out of phase? In phase. So I'm going to put the tone in the middle and the pickup selector in the middle. Right? Let's take it to the bridge. Okay. Anything? I think it sounds great. You want to hear the neck? Sure. What do you have on? What effect is on? I'm still using the Bell Epic because I like it, but I'll turn it off. Yeah. Go back to that bridge. I love it. For the viewers, should we put on just a skosh of the 1981 Inventions DRV pedal? Yeah, of course you should. Hint of overdrive. I'll go up into the neck. That's pretty good. It's great. I like how the neck at the 21st fret, how it's angled out. The same angle that the pickups are at. That's great. Let's put some fuzz war on here. Mm. Yeah, no doubt about it. This thing's got a vibe to it. 
I love it. Sunburst. Did you say sunburst? It only came in sunburst or, oddly enough, white. Oh, white. Those were the options. Man, this guitar. God damn. Do you want to know how it all started, though? Yeah, I think so. Well, I'm going to have to go back to 1851, Ed. Okay. Do you know a guy named Isaac Merritt Singer? No. Uh, did he make sewing machines? He did. How do you like that? Yeah. How do you like that pull? That was a great pull. In 1851, he founds the I Am Singer and Company. Company. Okay. They make sewing machines, Ed. He was also an erstwhile actor. He liked to go uh, trooping around with actors acting. Sure. Very kind of itinerant that way. <laughs> Man, John with the words. You like that? He was a erstwhile itinerant actor. Yeah, I could pull out some more if you want. Sure. Maybe I will. Who knows? He was mechanically inclined and liked to invent some shit. Okay. That's how he comes up with his ideas for the sewing machine. What year is this? 1851. Okay. By 1863, they are so big, they are the largest sewing machine maker in the world. That's just, what, 12 years later? Yeah. So big, they had to build and open their first large-scale industrial factory. Do you know where they opened that factory? Come on in. Japan? Come on in. Jersey. Yeah! <laughs> <laughs> they opened the first large-scale factory in Elizabeth, New Jersey. Oh, Elizabeth, New Jersey. Yeah, Elizabeth is one of the largest cities in New Jersey. It is the seat of Union County, my home county. Do you know that show, The Sopranos, Ed? You watched it. Oh, sure. You know, in the beginning, he's driving his car home. Mm hmm. And he's got his cigar lit and he's going over bridges and there's industrial shit in the background. Yep. That is the port of Elizabeth, New Jersey. Cool. 1889, Ed. Okay. Singer creates the world's first electric sewing machine. Ooh, what's that? Well, I noticed earlier when I was messing around with this that if I put on that fuzz and I put on the Old Blood Noise Endeavors Visitor mm. and the Walrus Audio Lillian pedal, Whoa. I can get a kind of out of phase sound. <laughs> It's got a very 70s vibe to it. Yeah, it's all like scooped out. Yeah. We like the scoopage. Oh, sure. Well, sewing machines, it's going great guns for them, literally, because in World War I, mm -hmm. they are forced to switch over to manufacturing munitions for the government for the war. Great. Isn't that nice? Yeah, God bless America. Shit like that. You're overseas. You're like some doughboy or something. Here's your gun. It says Singer on it. And you're like, wait a minute, like the sewing machine? Yeah. My gun was made by the sewing machine guy. The world is a wacky place, John. What do you think of that little hot take? Hot take. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I start this company and I'm making guitars and guitar pedals. And Uncle Sam comes in and he's like, yeah, you're not making guitar pedals anymore. You're going to make bullets and rifles. No, fuck you. There hasn't been a war since World War II that we could get behind. I think you're right. You know what I mean? Public sentiment just won't allow it. Big fuck no. Yet that doesn't stop us from being at war for my kids' entire lifetimes. Yes. And they can both vote. Nice. That's cool. It's awesome. Well, World War I eventually ends. Good. And they go back to making sewing machines. Good. Everything's cool, right? Everything's great. Yeah, but then World War II comes. Shit. So now they got to make guns and shit again. Okay. Was that the making guns noise? Oh, the making guns noise you want. Yes. Making guns. <laughs> Post-World War II, though, Ed, mm -hmm. they're back to making sewing machines. Great. The singer people. Finally. But here's what they do. They go over to Japan to a place called Matsumoto. They've come up before. They have. Just after World War II, they founded a very large woodworking factory with people that were master craftsmen making furniture, musical instruments, cabinets. These guys were really good. Cool. 
the literal word for woodworking factory is Mokujo. Okay. Mokujo. It's just occurred to me. Yes. Areas that are amazing craftsmen at musical instruments. Yes. We've got Italy. Yes. And Japan. Germany. Exactly. So what is it with these countries and the fucking fascist bullshit? Yeah, making chairs for the man. What do you think is up with that? Luthiers are just naturally drawn towards a real fascist lifestyle. Is that a thing? <laughs> naturally drawn to it, yes. <laughs> the chair dudes, natural fascists. <laughs> I'm trying to figure this shit out. I'm doing it real time, John. Yeah, you are in earnest, Ed. I see that. I'm not I'm not like researching this or anything. I'm just coming up with theories. Yeah. Real time. Yeah. The man says make another chair for the fire. Exactly. So Mokujo or Moku means woodworking factory. Okay. Between Matsumoto, the town, and Moku, you get Matsumoku. That was the name of the company founded in 1951. And that's when Singer comes in and says, we want to make you guys the Singer Sewing Machine Company. Sewing machines had cabinets you could put them in. Totally. I think for Singer, probably with no small amount of help from the U.S. government, the labor would have been cheaper in Japan. Sure. I just don't think I've ever heard of American companies going to Japan within five years of the end of World War II. I wonder how broad that was that American companies went into Japan. It wouldn't surprise me if they got concessions from the occupying government, from the Americans. Sure. Sweetheart deal. So the Matsumoku boys are making sewing machine cabinets and the, all the associated furniture that goes with that. Right. So maybe they're set for a while, but they're not. Okay. In the early 60s, as global manufacturing competition increases, Singer, they end their relationship with the Matsumoku boys, and they move to the Philippines. When was this? Early 60s. Wow. That is so much earlier than I picture outsourcing and cheap labor. They were ahead of the game. I guess so. So now Matsumoko, these guys that are highly skilled, they have a big factory. They know what to do with wood. What are they going to do? Build guitars. Yes. Fortunately, there's another company in Matsumoto, Fujigen. Okay. Fujigen is doing some guitars, but they're nowhere near as big and as skilled as the Matsumoku boys. So they partner with them. We are the company Fujigen. We are going to make electric guitars under all kinds of different names for people the world over. And you cats over there at the Matsumoku factory are going to be the ones to make them for us. Sounds like a plan. Let's do that. I counted close to 40 different brand names made by Matsumoku. That's a very different model than kind of the Chicago Boys model, where the Chicago Boys built their guitars and then they would just slap anyone else's name on it. The Matsumoto factory was actually taking orders, taking specs. Yeah. Hey, I'm going to go get some more coffee. I got some more coffee. Cool. I'm wondering to myself, John, Yes, Singer post-World War II, like right afterwards, if they were actually doing the government, Japan and America, a favor by going there. You know, I almost wonder if it was seen as a patriotic thing. Oh, as part of the rebuilding? Yeah. Like go over there and... Yeah, help. Inject capital into the country? Exactly. Sure. I think when I hear this stuff, I naturally assume the worst of people. Maybe given the time, maybe it wasn't a totally capitalist grab. Go to Japan and get cheaper labor. Maybe going into Japan in the 50s was maybe a little more positive. We should leave the door open for that so people don't think we're just... A-holes. Yeah, grumpy a-hole guys. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, Univox, you might remember, is a brand name. The actual company that owns that brand name was called Unicord. Right. Yep. They came up with that brand name after buying a company called the Amplifier Corporation of America. Okay. In the day, everybody acquiring more and more stuff, they're like, yeah, sure, we'll buy an app company. Oh, yeah. Hell yeah. So they came up with the Univox brand name to slap on them, and there you go. Eventually, they're like, maybe we should have guitars to go with these amps. That seems logical. Sure. So they get with Fujigen to get these things made. Fujigen designs them, sends it over to the Matsumoku boys who build these things. And in 1965, here comes the Univox UC2. 
This is pre the Mosrite copy, right? Pre. This UC2 is one of the first, oh, I don't know, five or six designs Fuji Jane came up with. Okay. And then over the years, there's tons of them. And that's how that comes to be. The Matsumoku boys back in business. Now they have something cool that they can use their superior woodworking skills on. Hell yeah. That was the underlying theme. These guys at the Matsumoku factory were woodworking badasses. Looking at this guitar, I see it all over the place. It's sick. All the little details. Tell me about the tremolo and the bridge on this thing. The tremolo and bridge are incorporated as one piece. And the thing I like about it is that the tremolo has a cover on it. So when I'm doing my palm muty business, like I like to do, my hand rests on that cover so I'm not accidentally. Yeah. That was all designed in-house as well. Eventually, Unicord was bought. You might remember this part. They were bought by Gulf Western. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember that? I forgot that they were one of those unicorn to Gulf <laughs> Western, like, fuck. And the funny part was one of the original guys was named Bernie Merson. I guess he made some kind of deal. And part of the deal was that his name would in some way have to continue to be associated with it. Sure. So they tacked his name onto the new name after Gulf Western bought it. So the name of the company, Ed... Ready for this? Yes. Merson Musical Products, a division of Unicord Incorporated, a Gulf Western Systems Company. God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Yeah. Um, this is 1967, by the way, this happened. What's the name of the company again? Merson Musical Products, a division of Unicord Incorporated, a Gulf Western Systems Company. I did some reading about the mid-60s, and while this sounds crazy that an oil company is buying guitars, it was sort of endemic across companies. It sounds like this is, oh, a crazy guitar thing that was just happening, and it wasn't. There were mergers and acquisitions to create these multinational companies. Post-World War II, the economy was booming and it was starting to contract. That's when these bigger companies were going in and like as smaller companies were starting to stagnate, they were just going in and gobbling them up. Uh, it occurred to me like, why is CBS, why is a TV company buying Fender? That's what was going on. CBS is just like, uh, let's buy some furniture companies and let's buy a guitar manufacturer and let's buy refrigerators. And, you know, it was that. Ugh. But when you hear it, it's like, what the fuck is Gulf Western doing with guitar companies? It's just so dumb. That happens to this day, doesn't it? The large companies will buy up the little ones if for no other reason than to just take them off the board. Sure. Buy it and kill it. Here's Ed, like, giving benefit of the doubt all over the place. Money bags Ed. Yeah. Are you wearing your monocle? Oh, totally. Okay, cool. When CBS bought Fender, they didn't buy Fender to, like, throw the company away. No. They thought, like, here's a company that has a valuable product that we want to continue building, and we're just going to do it because they believe in it. When you see that today, you think they're going to buy the name, and then they're going to throw away the actual core business. I hear you. Oh, wait, is this a guitar podcast? It is. <laughs> this thing's great. We are way into 2020, John. Way in. This is one of the coolest guitars we've done. Mantic. Phantom Operator. Greg and Zara just dropped an album on Bandcamp. Yeah, our good friends Greg and Zara over at Recovery Effects making music. Dead Ship Sailing is the band. Totally check it out. Totally. You should get on the interwebs and check out our good friends over at Recovery Effects. Yep. And it turns out they're not the only thing going on on the web. No. No, you can order shoelaces on the web. Did you know that, Ed? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Graham crackers. Okay. I feel like this is going somewhere. I'm just saying, it turns out the web is a pretty big place. Yes. I'll admit it. I didn't know that. What? You get on the internet box and you start typing stuff and stuff comes up. Yeah. So I would like to encourage people to go to thehighgain.com. Oh, yeah. I don't know how it got up there. It's pretty cool. Cool. 
I like this guitar a lot, John. I think it's one of my favorites of the year. It's sick. It's it's yeah. It's sick. <laughs> <laughs> Patreon.com slash the high game. Sure. You could do that. Sure. Our Discord server. Come join the conversation. Sure. That's been fun. I think that was pretty good, Ed, and it was a lot of fun. Yeah, it was great. It was great. Okay then. Okay. Okay, bye. Bye.